Good morning, baseball fans, and welcome back to Dan's Vintage Baseball PC. Do not be fooled by the fancy name. It's just me and some friends talking about baseball cards. And today, well, it's just me. Um, well, along with my new shirt from Reindeer Studios, um, talking about uh, the third installment in our Black History Month series, uh, talking about Sam Jethro today. Uh, Sam Jethro is perhaps not as famous as uh, the last two players we did, Campanella and Monty Irvin, but Sam Jethro is a pioneer in many respects and is sim pretty similar to many of the Negro League players who ended up in the major leagues in the tail end of their playing days. Uh, that is to say that they um, played their primes uh, in the Negro Leagues and came to um, the major leagues in um, like in their 30s or such. Um, Sam Jethro ends up was a rookie in 1950 at the age of 33. But let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, his bio. He was born in Alabama, I'm sorry, Mississippi, and um, but spent uh, his entire youth in East St. Louis, Illinois. Uh, he was a um, prodigy baseball player who played many in many different local Sandlot teams. Um, he was born in 1917, although throughout his career he gave his age um, as different numbers. But um, the research uh, that was done by Saber has been pretty convincing about Sam's um, background. Um, and I'll link in the description down below to uh, what is really extraordinarily well done Sabre bio of Sam. Uh, he played for, and I'll, let's go to his stats here. In 1938, he played for the Indianapolis Clowns for a very short period of time, and um, ultimately ended up coming back to St. Louis, uh, and he ended up taking care of his mother, uh, who was ill at the time. She passed away in 1941, uh, and then Sam, came back to play professional baseball in 1942. Uh, he played for the Cleveland Buckeyes. Um, the CCB is Cleveland Cincinnati Buckeyes, but they're ultimately the Cleveland Buckeyes. And he played for them for his entire New early career, which included 1945 when he um, was part of a Cleveland team that upset uh, the Kansas City Monarchs in the um, World Series. And ultimately, um, he became one of the most celebrated players in the league that year, uh, which led to uh, something which has been controversial over the years, which is the 1945 tryout at um, Fenway Park. It was Sam Jethro, Marvin Williams, and Jackie Robinson uh, essentially uh, doing a, a workout for the, um, for the Red Sox. And we talked about this in the Joe Cronin episode. Um, I think by all accounts, the Red Sox had to have this tryout to satisfy um, one of the local government officials who would threaten to take away their right to play on Sunday. Uh, and so they had a tryout, which was essentially just a voluntary workout, and none of the players heard back from the Red Sox. And, and that left the you know, a, a negative taste in the mouth of many of the people who were involved in it, particularly Jackie Robinson wrote about it years later. Sam Jethro didn't, didn't carry a grudge about it necessarily, although he did say in later years that it was definitely not a fair situation. But that being as it may, uh, he continued to play. And ultimately, uh, he did sign with the Dodgers. Uh, he signed with the Dodgers and played in 1948 in Montreal and was outstanding. Uh, Sam then played 1949 in Montreal, where his numbers were ridiculous. In fact, his 89 stolen bases were um, a league record for many, many years. and may it still, in fact, be the league record. He batted 326. He had home runs. He had both power and speed. Um, but there was apparently no place for him in the Dodgers lineup, which is kind of odd because left field, which is where he ended up playing um, much of his career with Boston, um, was not really occupied by any major players over the years with the Dodgers. It was mostly a platoon situation. Um, so he could have come up 
and played for the Dodgers. But anyway, so they ended up trading him or selling him to Boston, where in 1950, he came into the National League uh, and was a sensation. He uh, led the National League in stolen bases. Uh, He hit 18 home runs. He won the Rookie of the Year. uh, And he played for a Braves team that would ultimately um, be a nice organization for integration in terms of bringing in quality players. Um, And ultimately, uh, so ironically, he uh, was replaced by an African-American player, Bill Bruton, uh, in 1953. So what happens is Sam has a fantastic 50. He has a fantastic 51. 1952, he slows down a little bit. And, And that's because he's 35 years old. And ultimately... He sent down to the minor leagues. And if you recall our Monty Irvin episode, they sent Monty Irvin down to the minor leagues too. It's sort of disrespectful uh, in 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 historical in perspective. So he goes down to the minor leagues in 1953. Uh, he plays the full season down there, and ultimately he's traded to Pittsburgh in a bizarrely one-sided trade where the uh, Braves sent uh, Jethro and a couple of pitchers and, and outfielder Sid Gordon. To Pittsburgh in exchange for a middle infielder by the name of Danny O'Connell, uh, who wasn't all that good. So I'm not sure what that trade was all about, other than just moving people that they didn't want. Uh, he made one brief appearance for Pittsburgh. He ultimately ended up playing um, minor league ball for several years after that. Uh, and that was it. Uh, that was Sam's career. Uh, but it's a short career. But this is a baseball card channel, so let's talk about some of his baseball cards. This is my Sam Jethro flagship run. It starts with the 1950 Bowman, which is his rookie card, as you can see in the upper left. Uh, Nice story about how I acquired that card. Uh, I know I acquired it on the Sunday of the 2022 National in Atlantic City, uh, walking around, having secured pretty much everything I came to get. And with just a little bit of money left in my pocket, I'm walking around on Sunday and I come up to this uh, dealer who's got this Sam Jethro um, 1950 rookie card and he's got it uh, priced. It's a seven gorgeous card. Uh, He's got it priced at $50. And I'm thinking to myself, that sounds awfully low. So I go away, I check my comps on my phone, I come back and this card is really worth about a hundred bucks. So I go over to the dealer and I said, I don't know why, I'm, I'm super honest. I said to him, you know, you have this Jethro for 50 and, I re- and I'm going to buy it, but I just want you to know, I, I checked it out and, and your your price is about half of what it should be. Um, and the dealer looks at me and he smiles and he says, you know what, for you being that honest, I'm just going to sell it to you for the 50. Uh, so I bought this Sam Jethro uh, PSA 7 rookie card of the 1950 Bowman set for $50, which to me was a remarkable deal. Uh, next to that is the 1951 Bowman, Sam, uh, another gorgeous card uh, with the Braves uniform, beautiful colors, the blue background. That card I essentially got for free. I bought it in a large lot. Uh, graded the, I graded it myself. I bought it raw, sent it to SGC, and ultimately... Ended up getting the 4.5, which is a fair grade. Sold off the rest of that lot for what I paid for it. And I kept another a few other cards, too. So that essentially was a free card. Um, next to that is the 1951 Burke Ross. Um, that card is a result of some friendships in the hobby. Uh, somebody knew I was looking for Jethro cards. They said there was a really nice card on eBay. It was raw, but it, it, it presented really well. And it was cheap. It was like 30 bucks. So I went and bought it uh, and then sent that to SGC and got the five. Uh, the bottom left is the 52 tops, which we've seen before on this channel. That gorgeous, uh, I forget, Sean came up with the right color for it. I guess it's an olive green. It's sort of like a like a phosphorescent olive green or something. But it's a, it's a nice, no, it's not olive, uh, lime green. Anyway, another beautiful card is six. I know I bought this in an auction. I can't remember which auction, but I got it at a terrific price. Um, After that is the 1952 Bowman uh, card that I also uh, sent into SGC and got graded. Uh, And then, of course, the beautiful 53 Bowman. Oh, man. This card, I've owned a few of these, and I think I got the one that is the keeper here. 
it's um, it's a, a PSA 5.5. Um, but with the smile and the hat and, and, and the uniform and, you know, this is just, this, this is classic 53 Bowman and, and classic Sam Jethro, who doesn't have a bad card, as you can see. The only card I guess you could say is not great is the, uh, is the Burke Ross because the, the printing and the, the, the quality of the, uh, of the print and the paper and such, it's not terrific, but, uh, his, but all of Sam's Bowman cards are fantastic. Um, also got some other things here to show. Uh, these are two photos. After Sam was done in Boston, uh, he went down to Cuba and he played a season with Cienfuegos. That's C-I-E-N-F-U-E-G-O-S. Uh, and this photograph was taken by Photos Habana, R-F-M Photos Habana. So it was taken in um, Havana playing for Sinfuegos. Uh, that's the picture on the right. And, and if you notice, Sam's got a pair of glasses on. And there's a reason for that. And the story behind that is that he, um, he was, yes, a truly remarkably solid player with, the, with, the, with both speed and power. Uh, but his fielding was terrible. He led the American, the National League in errors for three consecutive seasons. The only three full seasons he played in the American, in the National League. I'm sorry. And um, one of the reasons is that he kept losing balls. He kept having balls fall at his feet. He would his if you look at his range factor numbers, he actually had the ability to get to the ball. He just, just had, I guess, just issues with seeing the ball, and so. At one point later in his Boston career, he was fitted for a pair of glasses, which um, changed his perspective. And he ultimately, he never came back to the major leagues because at that point when he's playing for San Fuegos, he's about 36 years old. But um, he played for years after that in the minor leagues and uh, the glasses worked. So there's Sam Jethro wearing a pair of glasses, which sadly, if he had had in 1950, his... Uh, brief career with Boston would have been even more remarkable. The picture next to that is um, the just a, a standard shot of him. Uh, I've narrowed this down to being 1952. And the reason is because of the players in the background. And the, this person over here is number 45, looks very much like a coach. Um, I don't know who that is because there's no 45 player and there was no 45 coach for either 51, 52, or 53, um, or 50 for the Braves. So I'm not sure who that is. That might have been some um, player who just came into camp. Um, the other player, there's a number 44 you can see right over here talking to a, a, a person on the sidelines, a number 44. When I first saw that, I got a little excited. So, oh. Was that Hank Aaron? No, it's, no, it's, it can't be Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron uh, wasn't on the Braves until 54, by which time Sam was not on the Braves. Um, but number 44, it ends up, is himself a great story. It is the Negro League legend James Buster Clarkson. Buster Clarkson uh, came to, was signed by the Braves, played in the minor leagues for several years, but he was one of those guys that was old. So by the time this picture is taken, in 1952, uh, Buster Clarkson is, I believe, 38 years old. Um, and he played about half a season for the Braves, played some third base, some shortstop. But for the most part, uh, Clarkson was was beyond his, his better years, and he didn't last. Uh, but that's interesting that he's in the background of um, this Sam Jethro. And, of course, the autograph is here. The um, certification is here. So this is a certified Sam Jethro autograph and a wonderful photograph. So... Happy to have that one. A um, couple more things to talk about. Um, I uh, would recommend this book. This book um, is a fantastic photographic history of the Negro Baseball Leagues. Um, it's written by Phil Dixon and Patrick Hannigan. Phil Dixon uh, is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, historian for Negro Leagues baseball. Um, Phil, I believe, was one of the founders of the Negro Leagues um, Baseball Museum, uh, and he lectures and, and, and 
goes to, you know, is involved in, in historical, um, you know, uh, speeches and, and presentations and all kinds of things. And he's written any number of books, but I think this is probably Phil's best book. But the reason that I bring this up is because there's two fantastic photos of, um, of Sam Jethro in here that I wanted to point out. One is on page 254, and it's Sam Jethro. He's on the far, I think he's, no, no, he's fourth from the right. Let, let me get this, sorry. Let me get this so you can see it. Here we go. It's um, right here. Jethro is fourth from the right, um, wearing a lighter coat. The gentleman up in the uh, door uh, is Satchel Page, and this is a Negro Leagues All-Star team that went out to play a barnstorming tour. I believe it was 45 or 46, I have to check. But um, the names here are, are, are terrific. Um, and, of course, Sam is there uh, with, uh, with the long coat, and they flew on a private plane for Satchel Page's um, uh, barnstorming team. And uh, I think it was Feller's team that they played a lot of games against. Bob Feller did a lot of barnstorming uh, with Page. So this is a wonderful photo from Phil Dixon's book. And there's one more Sam Jeffer photo to be seen here, which is a terrific one from his time with the Cleveland Buckeyes. And this is Sam right here, the first person um, right where my hand is covering him up. Uh, this is a uh, Cleveland Buckeyes um, photograph. And if you recall, like I said before, the Cleveland Buckeyes um, shocked everyone by winning the 1945 Negro League World Series um, led by a youthful squad uh, against what was seen at that point as the Kansas City Monarchs being the dominant team. But their players had gotten a little bit older at that point. So um, that's my Sam Jethro episode. Uh, thanks for coming along. It's a short one. It's under 20 minutes. Uh, so anyway, I've got guests coming up. I did this one alone because I didn't really have a guest I thought would be appropriate that would come on to my channel. But that being said, um, we have coming up next week uh, a show about the 1964 Topps Giants set. Um, I'm going to have the Gil Hodges show coming up. I'm working on the 19th, uh, a collector of the 1934 Gowdy. My 33 Gowdy guy is not done yet, but he will be. Um, so, you know, lots of things happening on the channel. Uh, and really just uh, a wonderful um, opportunity to share cards and, and talk with pl uh, people from the hobby and um, really enjoying this channel. So thanks for coming along, and um, we'll see you next Saturday.